that life isn't always rainbows and unicorns, that life doesn't always go like you think it will, that sometimes your fantasies as though, hey, life isn't, doesn't work out just like a fairy tale. Anybody understand that? Like sometimes you get into the fairy tale and then it feels like, hey, my, I think my unicorn's vomiting a rainbow. That's what life can feel like sometimes. And that's what we want to talk about in this series. And believe me when I tell you, that's probably the funniest part of it because it's one of the hardest subjects to cover, yet I believe it's going to have the most life-changing moment could possibly happen in this series. As we talk about the biggest question that I get asked as a pastor, it's actually one of the oldest questions, and it's this. Why do bad things happen? Why why do bad things happen? Why is there suffering? And, And some people ask it this way. Why do bad things happen to good people? Does that make sense? Or even like this, they might say, hey, I don't know that I'm necessarily a good person, but I'm trying to do the right thing, so why am I struggling? It, you know, hey, it just doesn't seem fair. It's like, hey, one plus one equals two, so if I do the right thing, I should get this, but instead, that's not how life always works. Does everybody understand that? And that's what I see the most pushback on, is when it seems like I'm suffering, if I suffered for a reason, or if I did something wrong, I definitely understand that, right? But if I'm suffering... And I, and I did the right thing, I just don't get it. Anybody ever ask that? The biggest question, though, that I get is this, is then their attention turns to this. Why does God allow that? Or, or is God even in charge? Is God not all-powerful? Can he not do anything about it? Or did he not know that it happened? Is he up in heaven and he's looking down and he's like, oh, I didn't know that happened to you, right? Is that where he's at? Sometimes it feels that way, right? Where, where is God? Where is God when this is happening? So we're going to go to a place, and I'm asking for your prayer, because most of my messages, I love to share my experience, strength, and hope, and I believe that God gave me that for a reason, and as a communicator, sometimes i got to get out of the way and let God do some things, and sometimes he uses me and some of the experiences in my life. But this series, I'm going to tell you, i got to get completely out of the way, because I don't want to share with you my experience. I want to share with you God's experience. God wants to give you a word from his experience, strength, and hope. I have a feeling that there's somebody that is struggling today with the question that I just asked you, and it's rocking your faith to the core. And I will tell you this, that the hard part about this series, and it's the reason why I'm asking for prayer, to be able to deliver the message from God, not me. Because I believe that this series has the ability to rock your faith to its core, which I don't think is a bad thing. I will tell you this, that once we share, what, once I share what I'm about to share, you cannot unhear it, okay? No matter what theological paradigms that you come from, you have to be a big church person to understand what I said there. No matter what faith you come from or what you've been taught or who wrote it in a book, we're going to go to the Word of God and let it stand on its own and say this, that let God be true and every man a liar. But I got a feeling that when you look at what we're talking about today, it's going to go real deep. <laughs> but I have a feeling you need it because some of us need a deep faith that we can hold on to. That some of us, our faith is though it's built on sand and the waves of life have come and knocked down your sandcastle. Is that true? And today we're going to help you understand. We're going to start the journey to be able to learn how to build your faith on a rock that will last. God has an answer. Not me. God has an answer to the question. And he's willing to share it. He's going to answer the question from the oldest book of the Bible. Some of us don't even know the book. Some of us have avoided the book. (laughs) Because I'll be honest with you, if you ever read it, it's confusing. (laughs) But today you're going to find there's more than you'll ever know about your faith that's found in the oldest book of the Bible. So we're going to turn to it. Now, before we get started, though, I do want to say one more thing. It can't be done in one message, just so you know. Okay. God's going to answer your question, but it can't be done in one message. Not because you couldn't sit, uh, and if you give me the next three hours, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Some of you guys are like, I feel like a unicorn vomiting a rainbow now. Um, <laughs> right? No. It, and it isn't that I couldn't condense it down. It's that we can't absorb it in one message. <laughs> what God wants to give you. So please don't think we're going to answer it all today, but I will tell you, there is an answer. 
It's going to stretch you. Be prepared to be stretched. That's why I'm asking for prayer. This is not an easy subject. It's one that we might even want to avoid, but I have a feeling that somebody needs it to the place that it's going to give you meaning for life. It's going to raise your faith to a place that it cannot. Anybody want unshakable faith? It could take you to that place. You ready? Job chapter 1. Job chapter 1 and verse 1. If you're looking in a Bible, you just turn to the book of Psalms, like right in the middle of the Bible, and then turn back one chapter, one book, and it's called Job. Some people have never heard of it. Here's what it says in Job chapter 1 and verse 1. It says, In the land of Uz there lived a man named Job. Now, Uz is so old that they don't know where it was. Okay, anyway, I've been waiting to say that all week. Sorry. (laughs) It rhymes. Okay, that's true. That's true. Historians really don't know because Job is so ancient. It's believed that Job actually lived before the time of Abraham. That Abraham lived in the land of the Chaldeans, which is ancient Mesopotamia, and Job actually came a little bit before that. It's kind of controversial when because we're not exactly sure where. Which makes it the oldest book in the Bible because Genesis, that writes the account of creation, actually came authored by Moses, right, who lived way after the time of Abraham. So we know that Job actually lived before Abraham. That's, that's what it's believed. And he lived in the land of Uz. Okay. This man was blameless and upright. He feared God and he shunned evil. Verse 2. He had seven sons and three daughters. That's ten children, if I can count. Okay. Verse 3. <laughs> And he owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 donkeys, and a large number of servants. And he was the greatest man among the people of the East. Okay? I mention it, and I, and I wanted to do the intro so you get an idea of who Job was. Okay? He lived in ancient times. He was a rich man. But I believe he was a rich man because he followed really good principles of life. He was a person that you would want to know. If you were in a business, you would want to have it. Now, we don't, well, I take that back. There are some people here from Zuna, so you might understand this part where there's cattle and sheep and oxen and things like that. All the rest of us, sorry, I'm just playing. (laughs) I'm messing with you. But what this means here is this. This is his business. His business is broken out into three parts. Okay? He's got diversity in his business. He's got sheep. He's got camels. He's got donkeys. And he breaks out his business in, in three parts. He's a great man. He has many servants, meaning he has many employees. And he's a godly man, meaning that he's following godly principles. If you've ever been to Financial Peace University, we learn, hey, if you do money God's way, your finances will be blessed. And Job's finances were blessed. His life was blessed. One plus one equals two, right? I lived like this, I did this, and I got this, and it's really fair, and it's pretty awesome, and he lives an incredible life. That's who Job is. If, if somebody was running for office like Job, we would say, man, that's the person we want. That's the person we want represent us. That's the person that if you needed a mentor, you would go to a person like Job. He's awesome. Needed to make sure you knew who he was before we go to the next part. Job is an amazing man who followed God. In fact, the next few verses that we're not going to cover, you can go back and read. He, start, he starts by saying this day, the day that we're going to talk about, he started it with prayer where he, he got up before his family and he prayed over all ten of his children. God, please help them. God, please keep me from sin, but keep them from sin. God, help them to follow your ways. Help them to find your purpose for their life. He's an awesome guy, right? An awesome dad, an awesome mentor, an awesome businessman. And he's having a good day. But we're going to skip down to verse 14. Here's what happens. A messenger came. A messenger came. Everything's going great. And then a messenger came. And I'm just going to give you a couple of highlights where instead of putting them all up because it's, it's a lot, okay? In verse 14, a messenger came, and here's what he said. All your oxen and donkeys have been stolen. And all the servants that take care of them, all your employees that take care of them, they all died. And I am the only one that lived to tell you. You maybe you don't understand what he's saying. A third of your business is gone. 
and all the people that you mentor, which I have a feeling if Job is a godly man, he cares more about the people asset than he does the stuff because it's like, hey, these are my real asset is my people. But not only that, they're my friends. They're the people I care about. I, I do part of my business just to take care of them. And they're all dead and gone. And all my, the third of my business just is gone. Verse 16 says this, while, they were still, while he was still speaking, another messenger came. This is verse 16. And fire fell from the sky, and he said, fire fell from the sky, and it killed all your sheep and all your servants that take care of the sheep. In the same conversation, within five minutes, he just lost two-thirds of his business. A businessman, if you're an entrepreneur in here, you understand what I'm talking about, right? Two-thirds of your business, gone. Your life's work, right? What takes care and feeds your family, two-thirds of it is gone. And the people that would help rebuild it, they're dead. While he was still speaking, I'm just not, not kidding, verse 17. While he was still speaking, another one came and said, all your camels have been stolen and they killed all your servants that take care of your camels. Is this registering for you? Your whole business is gone. You were the richest, greatest man of the East, and now you, you have no wealth left. That's your whole life's work is gone in the course of 10 minutes. Oh, I'm not done. While he was still speaking, another servant came. This is Job 1.18. Another servant comes, and you know what he says? Your, your children... Do you know where I'm going? All ten of your kids were in your house, and a wind came from the east, and it blew your house down. You, you ever gotten that call? Like, like it's almost like time stands still. What? And all of your children and your servants are dead. That's a day, isn't it? For, for, I did everything so good, right? What do you do? You understand why people don't want to talk about the book of Job? That's chapter one. Can I tell you the depressing part? There's 40-some 40, 40 chapters to the book of Job. This is chapter one. This is the intro. This is what happened in the life of Job. I've been doing the right thing, and now, boom. Let me ask you a question. Why does this happen? We're going to answer that question. This is why we don't like going here. He just lost everything, right? Days to come, he buries his children. And then he has another day. Job chapter 2. Let me, let me summarize that one for you. Job chapter 2 and verse 7. We're not ready yet. Job chapter 2 and verse 7. What happens in there is this. He breaks out in sores all over his body. It reminds me of sometimes when I see people that are under such distress, and I see this as a pastor, they break out in shingles. Have you ever seen somebody do that? It's so painful. It might have been worse. It's believed it was like boils or sores, open wounds that, that, that seep. And he goes out and he starts to scrape himself with pottery. Poor, homeless. His home was blown down, you know. And he scrapes himself. But the final blow is this. Job 2.9. You can write that verse down if you want. His wife comes. And she looks at her husband and she feels the loss of life and she speaks to him and here's what she says. She says, Are you still hanging on to your integrity? Why don't you curse God and die? Do you still believe in God now? You still hold on to your faith now? You didn't know there was a question like that, did you? Can't be too hard on Miss Job, right? Maybe it was sympathy for her husband. Maybe it was resentment. Maybe it was, a, I believe, it was a combination of all of it, right? She buried ten children. Hmm. I can see why we don't want to go here, huh? This is tough. 
But I believe that it's necessary because while we may have never experienced what Job experienced all at one time like that, a lot of us have experienced pieces of what I'm talking about. Is that true? Somebody here today has lost their business. Somebody here today has lost their job. Somebody has lost their wealth. Somebody here has lost their employees. Somebody here today has lost loved ones. Somebody has lost children. Somebody has a health problem that hurts so bad you can't think of nothing else. Somebody has turmoil in your house. And it begs the question, why? The question is, is what did Job do wrong? Next week we're going to talk a little bit about bad advice from some so-called good people, some, some godly people, right? I'm using the quotation marks. I think they are but they don't know what to do with it. And believe me, I don't think we know what to do with it. We want to put it in a nice little box with a boat, and it just doesn't fit. This book doesn't fit. That's why we don't teach on it very often, right? We don't like to go here. But today, our faith is about to get real. That's not a bad thing. It's a scary thing. There's one more scary part, though, and you're not going to be able to unhear what I'm going to tell you next. I don't think it's a bad thing, but I will tell you Anybody watch The Matrix? <laughs> the rabbit hole is about to get real deep. You get a choice. You can take the red pill and just act like it doesn't exist. And, or you can take the green pill and you can find out how far this thing goes. It's about to get super deep. It's about to take you to a place that you're, you may not have ever heard of. It may not fit in all of our little Christian books and our Christian paradigms and our theology. And God said, I never... Okay, well, you're going to find out what God said. Where is God? I'm not going to answer it. I'm going to let him answer that. And you know what? He answers it in the book of Job. The oldest book of the Bible, I would say that's pretty significant. The message that God wants to give is found right here, and we need it. Okay. We're going to turn back to Job 1, verse 6. It's something that I skipped over. The reason I skipped over it is, is because I was telling the story from Job's point of view. That's exactly what happened. I prayed, and then halfway through the day, a messenger came, and my whole life was demolished. That's what I wanted you to see. Where was God? Did you know that Job is one of the few books in the Bible that tells you? What was God doing when this happened? What was God doing before this happened? Because up till now, we might have been going, oh, I know, God was somewhere else, and maybe he just didn't know. That was Satan that did this, and God just didn't know what was happening, because God might be busy with other things, and he just, oh, no, Job, that happened to you? Job 1.6. After Job got done praying, here's what was happening in heaven. This is before all the bad stuff happened. One day, the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, I don't want to pretend that everybody comes from the same background, so if you don't know what angels are, I'll, I'll clear it up. So God, before he created the earth, created servants or messengers in heaven called angels that are there for him, and they sing, and they do all kinds of things for God. We don't know exactly what they look like. Anybody that says they do, it's described, but they're spiritual, so therefore we can't know everything about them. But they're there before the foundations of the world, and they do all kinds of amazing things. That's what, who the angels are. And they come and they present themselves before the Lord, meaning they're given an account for what they're doing. Here's the part that's interesting. And Satan also came with them. Who is Satan? There's all kinds of confusion over that, so let me clear it up. When God created the angels, he created one angel in particular named Lucifer, who was meant to be a servant, but through the process of free will, he decided that, hey, I will ascend and be like the Most High. And he challenged God, and God cast him out of heaven. He took with him a third of the angels, which became demons. And their, their sole purpose is this, is to steal, kill, and to destroy anything that God loves, including his people. That's the main battleground. That's who Satan is. Okay, verse 7. And the Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? And Satan answered the Lord from roaming throughout the earth, going back 
and forth on it. There's another scripture that says Satan is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. That's basically what he's saying to God. Where, where have you been? I've been looking through the earth to see what I can destroy. I might not be able to beat you, but I can, I can, I can hurt you, God. That's what he's saying. Verse 8. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? You might want to write that verse down because I think that's the one you're going to have to wrestle with. Who, who brought up Job? You're going to have to wrestle with that one. There is no one like him on earth. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. Verse 9. This is Satan's reply. Does, does Job fear God for nothing? Verse 10. Have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? You have blessed the work of his hands so that his flocks and his herds are spread throughout the land. Verse 11. But now stretch out your hand and strike everything he has and he will surely curse you to your face. Verse 12. The Lord said to Satan, Very well then, everything he has is in your power. But on the man himself do not lay a finger. And then Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. Do you know where he went? Oh, I'll tell you. A me the next part is, a messenger came to Job and said, you've lost everything. Satan did his work pretty well, didn't he? He struck everything. Like waves on a beach, like a storm that hits, boom, boom. Can I tell you, Job didn't have this perspective, but now you do. And you're going to have to wrestle with this just like I wrestle with this. That we go, well, wait a minute, there's free will and there is free will, but we have to come to terms with one part of this story that God put in here for us to understand and it's the one that's going to be the hardest thing to understand it's this that with everything bad that happens God is in control that God has never given up his control you can say that he has but if you do you're going to have to rip the book of Job out of your Bible because he's saying Satan couldn't touch him without God allowing it. Is that true? Now, please don't hear what I'm not saying, because I know we're going theologically deep today, and you might hear me say something like, are you saying that God caused evil? No, I am not. Are you saying that God is, is sinful or wants to hurt people or desires for people to be hurt? And I'm saying, no, I'm not saying that. What I'm telling you today is that nothing happens that God does not allow. He is 100% sovereign. That's clear, right? You, you cannot read this and say it any other way. Satan could not touch Job and tell God. In fact, I'll put it another way. It wasn't Satan that said, hey, I've been roaming the earth. Would you take your protection off of Job? It was God that said, wait a minute, Satan. He pointed Satan almost like an instrument at Job. There's way more to it than that. But it's something we have to wrestle with. At first, you think, God is in control. Oh, that's awesome. Until you feel the pain of life, and then it's directed back to say, wait a minute, God, I did, I'm doing the right thing. Where are you? I didn't ask that question. The book of Job does. And as a pastor, I would do you a disservice if we, we, we can talk about all the things and skirt around it and act like it. And you know what that is? It's fake faith. And today, we need real faith faith, and God is ready to go there, and I'm hoping you are too. I have some good and bad news for you. The good news is God answers the question. The bad news is we can't do it in one message. I wish I could, because you can't absorb it all at once. But I want to give you enough today that will be able to help us absorb some. And I want you to allow God to go to that place that sometimes we just want to push away and go, it just doesn't sound right, so I don't want to think about that. 
But some of you, that's right where you are, and it's all you can think about. And you've been asking and asking and asking God, and God is as though he's coming here today, and he's going, John, I need you to move out of the way because I don't need your experience, strength, and hope. You don't need my experience, strength, and hope. You need the experience, strength, and hope that's going to come from Almighty God in your life. And that's real. He's going to get real. He's not afraid of this question. He answers it. We're going to give you a piece of it today. Okay? This, the part we're giving you today is foundational. I want to show you how Job responds. From his response, we could learn so much as a foundation for where we need to go. Without it, you can try a lot of other things, but it won't work without understanding this response. So we'll go to Job chapter 1, verse 20. After Job lost everything in the course of minutes... This is before the second day where he had the sores. This is the first day when he just found out everything was gone, including his ten children. Here's what he did. At this, Job got up, and he tore his robe, and he shaved his head, and then he fell on the ground. I had to look up what tearing your robe and shaving your head means. It makes sense to do something weird, but that's not what he did. It wasn't just weird. It wasn't just, it's an expression. That's how they expressed grief. It's mourning. It means that's how you'd express when you're sad. That's important. Job expressed his grief. That's probably more important than you can imagine. He allowed himself to grieve. And while he was grieving, he fell on the ground in worship. That, ver that verse is in your thing. I would say to underline both, fell to the ground and worship. Both. Grief and worship at the same time. Or, or did you think that, that worship is always just happy? Is that what you thought? That the word worship, Rick Warren, I love the way he defines it. He defined it this way. It's simply loving God back. It means that even in the time of grief, you can experience God's love. That you can grieve and love God at the same time. Verse 21. And he said, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave. And the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. <laughs> we sing that song. And with a personality type like mine, and maybe, maybe you're the same as I am, you know which part I focus on? The Lord gave. When I praise God, I focus on what he's given, not what he's taken. But the J book of Job isn't about what he's given it's about what he's taken. How do you respond when God takes away? I don't like to talk about that. Next week, we're going to show you some things that don't work, ways that we put it in nice, neat packages, that we have advice, and we have books and Christian books and literature and even songs that are so apart from what God wants to teach us because we can't hardly take the fact that he's the same God when he gives. That's great. But it's not just name it and claim it and grab it and grab it that there is times that God takes away not to punish you. Why does he do that? Is there an answer? Is it okay to grieve? And Job answers the question the Lord has given, but now he's taken away. He's the same God. And he praises him in his grief. Verse 22. In all this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. Do you know what that means? It means that God was right, right? When he talked to Satan, I hope you don't think that this was just, I've heard it put this way, but the more I've read it and the more I've studied it and I've spent a lot of time in my quiet time leading up to this message, reading one chapter at a time, pouring over the book of Job, 
This is not just a contest between God and Satan. If that's what you think, then it's not just like God made a bet and he's just playing with our lives and we're like little lab rats in his experiment of life. That's how it could read, isn't it? It's so much deeper. It means that God was right about Job's faith. By the way, the next day in chapter 2, do you know what happens? Satan comes back to God. This is the part we didn't know, right? Before he gets the source, the, the, on day number two, after he's buried his children, and, it, and, and, and Satan comes back to God, and he says, hey, by the way, did you notice Job did not curse me to my face? And Satan says, really? Well, how about this? Skin for skin, God. Let me touch him and see how he does. Let me touch his body and see what he does next. And sores come all over his body. And his wife is the final linchpin because I believe Satan understands when to strike. He's watched humans for forever. Right? He understands human behavior better than anyone else. He is, he is a qualified enemy. You have to admire that as an enemy, right? That just the fact that how much he knows about human beings. I know what his wife will do. And the final straw was the whisper in the ear that says, Job, your own wife is telling you your faith doesn't work. Where is God? Here's Job's response. Job chapter 2, verse 10. And he replied, you are talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? In all this, Job did not sin in what he said. (laughs) He held on to his faith in his grief. I wish I could give it all to you today, but I just am going to give you a few takeaways. Just a couple of things that you can take from this foundational thing that just happened. Okay, three things. Number one. Number one. Allow yourself to grieve. Number one. The takeaway from chapter one and two is allow yourself to grieve. I can tell you as a pastor, it's the most unpopular thing. I can tell you, as I've done a lot of personality types on myself, I can't stand it, right? I don't like grief. I don't grieve well. I don't know how to, I don't like it. And I do a lot of things to get away from it. And you know what? I watch other people, and we're the same. We're not set up for it. How do you respond to grief? Well, I want to get away from it, right? But I'll, I'll give you a verse, and maybe it will help you. Second, Second Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 13 I've memorized it, not because I've memorized the whole Bible, but because I read it at every funeral. And he's talking to people that have been stuck in grief, people that don't know how to respond to grief. And the Apostle Paul says, I see you're uninformed about those who sleep in death. You've been uninformed. You don't understand death. Anybody? I don't understand why these things have happened. And that's what the church at Thessalonica was like. And in 2 Thessalonians 4, verse 13, he says, I don't want you to be uninformed about those that have died that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who has no hope. Now, I will tell you that a lot of us as church people, we've read that that means don't grieve. That's not the word, though. It's don't grieve like, meaning don't suppress your grief, but there is hope. There's hope even in the midst of the grief, but don't suppress your grief because when you suppress it, what happens, right? Right? Have you ever done that? Have you ever taken an emotion like grief that you go, I just can't think about that, so I'm going to ignore it. I'm going to pack it all up in a nice little box, and I'm going to shove it all the way down and act like it doesn't exist. Can I tell you what that is? That's fake faith, right? Some of us even hold on to a a fake faith, right? Praise God. I'm praising him. Nothing bad will ever happen. I'm not accepting that into my life, even though it's your real reality, and your life is ridiculous, right? It's what happened. Can you imagine Job saying that? My children didn't really die. My house didn't really get taken. It didn't really happen. And they're just living in a state of denial. Is that, is that what faith is? Or, or, or we go, hey, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to run from it. You ever tried that, right? It's how, it's how addictions are made, right? It's how vices are made. I'm going to turn to a vice, and that's going to help me. I will drink it away. 
Does that help? Well, let me ask you a question. Does it? Anybody struggling with that? I can drink it away. I can drug it away. I can eat it away. I can sex it away. And you can't fill the void, can you? You can't get enough. You, you keep trying to fill it and fill it and fill it. Won't work. I have one more thing. We medicate it away. I say that very carefully because I do understand that medical technology has allowed us to be able to take medication to help us physically, and it's helped us psychologically, which is great. And I take, I take nothing from it, so please do not hear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying medication is bad. What I'm telling you is we live in the most medicated society in the history of mankind, yet we're the most depressed people that have ever lived. More suicides than any other time. Because why? Because we don't know how to express grief. This book's going to take you to a place. You've got to express it, or you can man up like I do, right? I'm a man, right? Tell you how I handle grief. You know how I handle grief? I get mad. You divert. Is that what you do? You, instead of expressing grief, I express anger. How could this happen? Who's at fault? And you start blaming. And then the biggest target that there is, God, I just read it to you, right? God is in heaven and he let this happen. I don't believe in him anymore. Is that where you're at? Let me ask you a question. How's that working for you? How's it working for you, right? Or you can allow yourself to grieve. Allow yourself to feel it, express the grief. And out of the expression of grief, that's one, allow yourself to feel it. Number two, in the time of grief, worship God. Not because you're happy, but in your grief, allow God to love you and allow yourself to love God back. Stop pushing him out. Which will lead to the third thing, and it will have to remember that God is in control. That's the hardest part, isn't it? God is in control even in my grief. And there's going to come comfort from that but it's going to take time to absorb that. How does that work then, John? I'll leave you one more thing that will put it all together for today. In no way does it finish the thought. But I need to leave, since I decided to suck all of the hope out of the room, I need to put a little bit back. I need to put a little bit back. It's like a doctor that, that realizes, hey, you got an infection and we have to cut it. It's going to hurt before it feels better. But it's real. And now God can really heal you because we're real. We're not suppressing it. We're not lying about it. We're not building this on a house of sand. We're building this on the foundation of the rock that will stand the test of time. It will stand up to everything. And I want to give you that piece of hope today to take with you. The first part is this, is that by the way, this is only chapter 1 and 2. Did I tell you that? <laughs> no wonder people don't like to read this, right? By chapter 9, let me tell you what happens. Next week we're going to talk about bad advice. And so-called godly people come to Job and they go, Job, you must have done something wrong. I mean, what is going on in your life? Because God is a just God and he only gives good gifts. So we know it must be you. And Job is going, I am perplexed because I believe in God, but I, I didn't do anything wrong. And, and here's what he says in Job chapter 9. I just want to make sure I get the right verse so you can look it up for yourself. Job, Job 9 and verse 33. He says, If only there was someone that could mediate between me and God. If I could only have an audience with God, but here's the problem. Who can stand up to God? Who can make my case before God? Who can take this and tell God, God, what are you doing to Job? Who could explain this, right? I don't mind suffering. I just want to know that there's some kind of meaning behind it, right? Isn't that true? Viktor Frankl, who suffered about more than anybody in Nazi Germany, he wrote in his book, of his journal, he said, people can suffer all kinds of things as long as they know it has meaning. But meaningless suffering, you'll lose all hope. That's where Job is. Who can mediate? 
Okay, here's the hope. 1 Timothy 2, verse 5. I'll read it. For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus. Job screams for 30-some chapters. Believe me, I've been reading it one chapter at a time in my quiet time. He screams, where is the mediator? And God answers. You know how he answers? He sends his one and only son, who was and is and is to come, who is, who is part of the tri, triune God. He sends his only son to be born like a man and lives the sinless life and dies on the cross for the sins of the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Yeah, that's nice, John. And on the cross, Jesus Christ bore all of the sin of all of time onto himself. All of the pain that sin caused, he bears onto himself. So any pain you've ever felt, anything you've ever done wrong, any, any pain you've, you've let out on another person, Jesus experienced it all in one sitting. That makes us the ability, as Jesus gives his own life for ours, it gives us the ability to reconcile with God, sinful man with God. I got a feeling you're going, well, that's nice, but how does that help me right now, right? I mean, like, I get you, but, but I still am at a loss for understanding how this works, and, and so I need, to, I need to finish the rest of the thought. Jesus died on the cross for the sins of the world, and then he was buried, and in three days he rose from the dead. And after he rose from the dead, he appeared before people for 40 days so that they would say, hey, oh, he resurrected from the dead. Eyewitness testimonies of thousands of people saying that he rose from the dead. Eyewitness testimonies of people that gave their lives to say he rose from the dead. I mean, that's, that's a fact. And then after 40 days, he went on to the Mount of Olives and he gave the Great Commission in Matthew 28 and said, go and tell other people that I've come and died for the sins of the world. But then where did he go? He ascended back into heaven. The best way I can put it is he's on the Mount of Olives and he floats off the earth and he goes back to heaven where God is. But what does he do there? And in the book of Hebrews, we know that when he gets to heaven, he sits at the right hand of the throne of God. The right hand, right? I'm sitting in the right hand. God, the throne of God, the right hand of God. That means all power. Seated, meaning I finished the work of atonement. There's nothing left. I'm the lamb slain before the foundations of the world. I'm worth more than the existence of all mankind. But I sit at the right hand of the throne of God to do what? In the book of Hebrews, it says he sits to make intercession for you. You know what it means? It means that Jesus sits at the right hand of the throne of God and prays for you. That's what he does all day, every day. That he sits at the right hand of the throne of God and mediates. You see, Job screams in his book, the whole book, I wish there was somebody who could stand for me. Right? God answers it with his son. And you see, this is where it's going to be hard because we're bringing God into the equation and we're trying to understand how all of it works. And we're going to go to some places, but here's what I need to, you to understand. I cannot explain all your pain away today. I would never do that. But what I'm asking you is this. Is in your pain, what difference does it make that Jesus died on the cross? What difference does it make that he sits at the throne of God and mediates for you? My question is this. When I say that God is in control, what comes to my mind first is, is then he cannot be good, right? If he lets this happen, how could he be good? I don't need a faith like that, do you? But the part I needed to share with you today is this. Is Jesus Christ enough for you to say God is good. <laughs> N 
Not, not enough for you to understand everything. Enough for you to trust God. Right? That he bore all your sin and all of your pain. You don't understand everything. I get it. But is he enough for you to trust God with the things you don't understand? There's a lot more. But that's what you can take for today. You know what, I'm, you know what I think God's asking for you? Just crack the door for him. The, the person that, that you, you got all, you got everything built in your mind, you got the case of all cases against Almighty God, and he's saying, wait a minute, can I ask you to do something? Could you just allow me to come in just a little bit to help you? Now, I understand everything. Just let me in and see what I can do. Because of Jesus. Is that enough for you to trust me? Hope you'll come back next week because we got a lot more. But for today, would you take this? Would you wrestle through this? And maybe let Jesus be your mediator. I'm going to get out of the way and let God do what only he can do. Can I pray for you guys today? Let's, let's stand for prayer.